Hi and welcome back to a clear bench. I was having difficulty with that big basket of radios on here actually doing anything so what, I've moved it off. Clean bench, bit of room. So next up Dynatron Nomad. Um, now did I say this was a TP10 or the TP11? Cool, it's stiff. It's a TP11. So I have got some uh, actual service data for this. I've got uh, the original manufacturer's service manual. So, dates from around about 1960 this one. Um, so I've already given you a quick overview on it. It's time really to um, Put some power on it and see how we get on. Now, this is not, uh, it's wired up a little bit different. But I'm just going to see if I can get some power on it without hooking a battery up. It looks like, yeah, I can just hook onto the power switch there. So, let's, uh, make sure, make sure we get it the right way around. Well, the power stuff up to start with with a bench power supply. You never know, something might be shorted out and having a battery hooked up to it could overheat the battery. Also, um, probably ruin your output transistors as well. So, always worth doing. With 9 volts. See what it draws, so it's not drawing anything at the moment. Ease it up a bit. Okay, so we're on 12 volts now. Quite a loud humming noise. Could just be because we haven't got enough power on it yet. That doesn't sound good, does it? <laughs> okay, that's not that sounding scary. <laughs> Let's turn that off. That's, um, I think that's going to be capacitors to be honest. Power supply capacitors, certainly got a fair bit of hum there. So let's um, investigate a little bit further. Bear with me, I'm going to grab the manual for it and uh, we'll start pulling it apart. Okay, here we have a Dynatron service manual. It covers a few models, but in the middle there is the Nomad TP11. Now, as I say, I was lucky to get these. They were in a box of um, other literature, a load of old TV magazines and that, which I've still got. So if anyone's into vintage TV, I've got quite a few old vintage TV magazines somewhere. So this is actually the original like dealer's manual. Um, some lovely bits in this. So we've got all the sort of updates, basically typos, things that they've got wrong in the main listing. We've got um, something here that looks really interesting. A Dynatron um, service bulletin from December 1960. Look. Service manager would like to take this opportunity of conveying to you their very best wishes for Christmas and hopes for success and prosperity in the new year. Look, <laughs> that's a lovely document to have, isn't it? And again, it, it it it's got some like little fixes that obviously the dealers are told by by Dynatron. A couple of things, you know, there's a couple of things on the uh, TP11 there. Instability on long wave. Um, they've added a 150 ohm resistor in series with a wiper of S2, switch 2, 
to the top end of R32 and also a high proportion of intermittencies on this model have been found to be due to the trimmer bank. The adjustment screws are removed, the offending trimmer can be rectified by careful adjustment of the spring leaf, in other words give it a bend. So yeah, this record player Zerla, Dynatron Romani, one we're interested in is here, the Nomad. So again, very detailed and uh, easy to read instructions as well. So, uh, super heterodyne, portable receiver, medium and long wave only. It's got the socket for car aerial. Date released is blank, but as I say, it's got to be 1960, somewhere around there. I don't know if there is any uh, printing dates on any of this, doesn't look like it. Uh, well, it's a date of 1959 look, on the um, sketch for the drive cord. Yeah, 2nd of uh, April 1959 on the main schematic there, look. And they've even got a little uh, layout diagram showing you where everything goes, look. So wonderful bit of uh, literature to have. I'm really chuffed I managed to get hold of this. Normally anything like this gets snapped up pretty pretty much straight away as soon as it becomes available. So yeah, that's the circuit layout. Pretty straightforward. There is some useful information in here as well. It also says that um, care should be exercised when replacing components on the board since the laminated board will blister at a temperature of 200 degrees C. Look. So uh, basically you need to keep your uh, soldering iron I would think below 200. I normally run mine around about 300, 350. But then I don't uh, hold it on for very long mind you. So a uh, prolonged application of a soldering iron should be avoided. It even says um, the solder composition looks 60% tin, 40% lead. <laughs> it even gives an gives an instructions here on how to remove a resistor or capacitor from the board. So the same, basically cut cut the leads of it and uh, solder the replacement to the ends of the leads. Yeah. So basically, take the component out by snipping it out, and then uh, remove the leads with the solder and iron. Removing the chassis from the back from from the cabinet. Then that's going to be our first uh, trick. Four retaining screws on the chassis flanges. Withdraw the chassis from the cabinet. Removing the batteries from their holders. Loud speaker leads are long enough for the chassis to be laid on the bench. So it's basically just four screws. So let's uh, keep that one there. Getting back. So I believe on these, it's these four like little little nuts here. Let's come back out a bit. So you've got a big substantial metal piece here, and then you've got these one, two, three, four brackets, four nuts, bolts even. Be careful with this because I don't want to break that um, string off really. Be careful with that. Right, let's see if we can find a socket that fits this. Get my old Imperial sockets out. Never right the first time, is it? Slightly bigger. No, bigger again. Hmm. Doesn't look like I've got one that actually fits those. Smaller than that. Right, 
there we are. So it looks like it's a three sixteenths. A little bit too far recessed to get that to start them. I'll have to use uh, some pliers just to start them off. Let's get some smooth jewels. Got to churn these up. Cool. I'm going to do is I'm going to get it out of the chassis. I'm going to have a look at some of these um, capacitors. Because I'm sure that's what's um, stopping it working for the minute. Do that with a little spanner actually, he's far enough away. So be very careful of these um, ferrites as well because they are very fragile. Look at the length of the things, you know. I mean, what are they? It must be, it must be ten-inch ferrites. Bear with me. Yeah, ten inch. <laughs> ten inch ferrites, huge. Right again, uh, certainly made with servicing in mind these radios. As I say, it's just really delicate with these ferrites. There we go. So for a minute I'm going to just pull those leads. Take a quick uh, picture which way round they are. Right, that's the case uh, safely out of the way. So let's have a look, see if there's anything obvious. Just look at, look at the build in this lap. I mean... All the um, resistors have got like metal end caps on them, which uh, again I haven't seen before. Uh, where are we? Yeah, I don't know if you can see that on oh, those resistors just there. Let's get the light down a bit closer. Center the camera up a bit more. Yeah, so you can see the resistors in here. You can see them very well. How's that? Yeah, all got metal um, metal tops on them on each side. These um, these capacitors here, you know, it's very rare that they're any good. Shame because um, if I replace them, it's going to detract from the look of the set really. But I think they're going to have to go. We'll see. 
So just really quickly having a, a look over it, we've got these, um, as I say, Ed is one um, transistors, XB103 look. A102 output so XC131 by the looks of it. There's all sorts of dead things coming out. Let's have a look at the back of the board. Looks very clean. Can't see any signs of um, work being done on it, which is good. a little track that might have been repaired there but um, just really looking for dry joints anything untoward that might um, make it dead it's a little diode in there I don't know really I don't know what that one is Again, this is getting back probably before my my um, knowledge really. So I've got no experience of these Edison transistors. I've not seen a radio with these um, capped resistors in before. It's got some Hunts film capacitors in there. I don't know whether that'll be any good, but it's these plessy things. Trying to see if I've got anything obvious, really. It's a very, very well made bit of kit, this is. I mean, when you see the components in here, the brass work, the pulleys and everything, <laughs> if you can see in the tuning capacitor at the top there. This is all machine brass, very nice, slow motion drive, all geared. Big old IF cans, some sort of little module there as well. Just looks like another can inside there, there might be a couple transistors as well, you never know, let's just uh, pop that one, so it's only a push fit by the looks of it. Yeah we've certainly got a few things in there. that because I said I don't want to slip and do anything to these ferrites. They do make me nervous these. <laughs> but, uh, again I'm more likely to break them if I take them out than if I just leave them in, in place. It's got to be one of these capacitors. So let's have a quick look at the schematic a minute. Huge great schematic. 